We are in this together. You have gifts that I don't have, and I have gifts that you don't have. That we must see. Now is the time. Because it's when we all get together that we will make the changes that we must make. We are the world. Welcome to Malcolm and We on exclusively on malcolmpresents.com a new streaming service creating new half hour shows daily anyway today our guest is alan weiss where uh, alan where <laughs> i got the i got excuse me alan that's okay it could be why where what because I, I i have your name right in front of me <laughs> but it's I'm, I'm in los angeles so it's only uh you know, 10 o'clock and 10 o'clock, I'm still a little, yeah, you know, going on my second cup of coffee. Anyway, Alan and my co-host is uh, Yana Larson. And Yana, could you introduce our guest with the right sure. name, please? <laughs> We're very lucky to have Alan Ware here today. He's a busy guy saving the world. So we're, we're, this is an honor, Alan. Um, and listen carefully because there'll probably be a quiz later. Alan is the founder and global coordinator of the Network Parla Parla <laughs> Parliamentarians for Nuclear Nonproliferation and Disarmament, otherwise known as PNND. He's a trained educator and be began making peace education his own project in the early 1980s. He founded the Mobile Peace Rant Society educated on all aspects of peace education in New Zealand kindergartens, elementary schools, and high schools, and he helped the New Zealand government to develop peace studies guidelines for the school curriculum and was active in a successful campaign to ban nuclear weapons from New Zealand. Then in the 1990s, he shifted to New York to advance international peace and disarmament campaigns with a focus on the United Nations, and this included action at the UN Security Council on the Gulf War, UN negotiations, and leading the efforts to achieve an international court of justice decision on the illegality of the threat or use of nuclear weapons globally, something we are aware of now. From 1992 to 1999, he was um, also the executive director of the Lawyers Committee on Nuclear Policy. And in 1995, he founded the Global Network, network for the Abolition of All Nuclear Weapons. And this network quickly grew to over 2,000 organizations worldwide and has as its main objective the achievement of a global agreement, including the nuclear armed states to prohibit and eliminate nuclear weapons. That's quite a mouthful. Yeah, Alan, you're, you're making me tired. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been around for a little while now. And he says he has no, uh, he doesn't need any time for personal time because, you know, saving the world is part of his thing. So yes. <laughs> we, are, we have fun while we're doing this work. We meet wonderful well, people. It's all inspiring. Well, you, you sure do. And you, you've you done a lot, in addition to meeting all of the amazing people around the world in this field, you also have a great chance to work with some really fantastic youth. Mm -hmm. That's got to be, I mean, that's where we really have to be, isn't it? With youth who are focused and hard yeah, workers and I mean, I've been engaging with this wonderful youth initiative called Youth Fusion, Fusion is like bringing things together. It's sort of uh -huh. connected a bit to like nuclear weapons because the bigger nuclear bombs are fusion bombs, but really they've yeah. flipped it on the, on its head. And it's like it's it's bringing youth together also with those who are more experienced. They do a lot of intergenerational work um, and also bringing together youth who are working on climate issues, human rights, uh, you know, other environment issues, uh, peace and nuclear disarmament, uh, because these are all very similar sort of campaigns in terms of having to reach out across our borders beyond our nationalities, uh, beyond whatever faith we may have or may not have, um, to see that we have a, a common planet, that we that is home to all of us, 
this planet Earth, and we have to build our security through a common security, not through threatening each other, not through methods which are you know going to destroy our environment upon which we rely, but on things that are going to be protecting, preserving the planet as a whole. So youth fusion is really epitomizing this idea of youth engaging uh, in a common security framework uh, using the experience of elders, but the enthusiasm and new ideas from youth. Well, that's, it, it goes so along with We the World because it has several, you know, many things like gender issues is one of them that I know that I think it's Michaela that Sorensen that's working on a lot of, on that aspect. But it's the idea of um, all ages, all backgrounds working together. And there are all these things that can stand alone, like climate, gender issues, you know, but they're also very related and you can't look at one without looking at another and see how they affect each other um, positively or negatively. Well, well, I, 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 yeah, I, no, just one thing. As I was looking at your background and I see all the issues that you're involved with, how do you choose what to pick? Because each of the things that you're doing has worldwide, uh, you know, effects. Uh, uh, yeah, I would look, I, I tend to look things at strategically, like what that, with, where, where, what, what some skills I have, what networks or background, what capacities do I have, and where that might be most effective. And so sometimes it might be working on you know, setting up peace education programs in schools, because I had a background as a teacher, and I had a capacity to be able to engage with the New Zealand government, with the Ministry of Education, to develop peace studies guidelines so that teachers all around the country could do it so at that part of my life that was the best capacity and that was the most effective thing I could probably do and then I had the opportunity to come over as Yana says to come over to New York and start working on international issues uh, my first my first um, experience of that was working with the World Federalists uh, and setting up the campaign to establish an international criminal court uh, we now have that International Criminal Court. Um, and then after that, because I had some of the experience being at the United Nations when we had this issue of nuclear weapons and we wanted to take that to the International Court of Justice to get a determination that the threat or use of nuclear weapons is illegal, because I had some of those New York networks, um, I was sent back from New Zealand to, over to New York, New York again to set up that project. Um, and that was, I think, you know, effective getting that ruling from the court. Um, and that one now is paving the way to the, the really exciting one that I've been helping out now. Um, and it's come from young people, uh, started with the Pacific Island students fighting climate change and then picked up by World's Youth for Climate Justice. And this is to take the issue of climate to the International Court of Justice. Now, why these are necessary is because of what I mentioned, we are working on a global planet. We can't just deal with these issues on a nation state basis. There has to be a, a law, a processes, a cooperative a, approaches that uh, are across the board that apply to everybody. Um, otherwise, the world's going to collapse. If we keep thinking of ourselves as nation states and defending those with nuclear weapons, we're going to end up with a nuclear war. If we address climate just by what we have pushed our country to do. I mean, I can push my country, New Zealand, which is pretty good, but if our neighbours aren't doing good work on shifting to a green economy, it all falls apart because those who are doing good uh, get disadvantaged in the, in the, in the uh, competitive disadvantage with the, the, the cost that they have to incur to do things. So taking things into the international realm was so important. This is why the young people said, look, this is you know, a critical issue of possible survival of humanity and the world. It's a global issue, so we have to take it to the global court. So it's now in the court. Uh, they managed to move uh, Pacific Island states to launch the initiative at the UN General Assembly. Uh, we as civil society don't have direct access access to the International Court of Justice, it has to go through the United Nations system. Um, but they managed to get the governments to pull, pull together a resolution that was adopted March 29th this year. So now the case is starting in the court. And this will provide an opportunity to really bring the science about climate change into one place and get a sound analysis of it to apply all the law that's appropriate, the law protecting health, the law protecting human rights, the law protecting the environment, the security law, that's all applicable to this climate issue and can be applied by the judges in the International Court of Justice and then come out with a conclusion 
basically which will be laying a very strong legal obligation across the board on all countries, but also not just on the countries, but also on other stakeholders, on the corporations, for example. They're also part of the, the process. So the obligation will be universal to, to seriously cut the carbon emissions because we're not doing good enough. At the moment, we're, we're rushing headlong into, into climate catastrophe. So that will come out. Plus, also, the court will be looking at how to deal with the issues of the impact that climate change is already ha happening, particularly on marginalized communities and developing countries. So this is what I'm really excited about. Uh, again, it's a, it was youth-led, but it's now they're engaging you know, policy, scientists, lawyers in order to ensure a, a successful case. Um, so that's one that we're working on at the moment. Right, you said you're going uh, tomorrow to the uh, to the UN. Uh, no, the 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 question has been asked by the United Nations General Assembly to the International Court of Justice, which is based in the Hague. Um, it will take a little while for the case to to um, to uh, to conclude. Um, the first part is input. So at the moment, what we're doing is we're working to ensure that um, the governments and their submissions have the have the good science, have the right legal arguments, have the right solutions to put to the court. So that's the work we're doing at the moment. We're not at, we won't actually be in the court yet. Uh, the, the oral hearings where where this uh, where, the, where there's a lot of the back and forwards will happen a little bit later in the process. Well, it's still there's pro there's progress happening. And um, where, where is your next destination? You're in Prague uh, right now. Actually, yeah, I'm in Prague at the moment. I've just come from Bangkok where we, where we released a book called Earth Trusteeship, uh, Environmental yeah. Governance, um, which is looking at not just this case, the ICJ case on climate change, uh, but also on some of the proposals uh, to look after also the oceans. Because uh, the climate is not the only environmental issue. Uh, we also have forests. Uh, we, we have outer space as well. Uh, and we need better governance of those. So one of the proposals that the UN Secretary General has put forward is to repurpose the Trusteeship Council of the United Nations. Uh, when it was United Nations was first established, the Trusteeship Council was just to look after states which weren't quite independent yet. They were being held in trust. Um, but, but now there's a new purpose for trusteeship. We need to have trusteeship over the global commons uh, in, in order to, to protect that. Uh, and we and the, U, the trusteeship council could do much better if it was repurposed that way. Now, that's quite a tough ask. You know, reform of the UN is quite difficult. But the United Nations is holding a summit for the future uh, in 2024. So we're basically putting forward these proposals to governments now through a number of consultation processes and building up some support for this idea. Uh, and uh, and said, hopefully in September 2024, uh, we will get something adopted by the summit. We know what the summit will do, most likely, uh, that seems a bit in the bag, and that's to set up a position of a UN special envoy for future generations, uh, which is really good because that's, that will then help to ensure that international planning is thinking not just about now and about today, not just about next week, but about what we're doing and how it's impacting into the future. Um, and that will be brought much more into the global planning through having a special envoy. But that's just a small ask. The bigger ask, which we hope to do is, as I said, repurposing the Trusteeship Council. So we're actually bringing the governments together in a much better format for managing the global commons than what they do at the moment. At the moment, they come to like the COP meetings and argue amongst each other and sort of end up with the lowest common denominator. Mm -hmm. uh, just, just one yeah. negative criticism. Uh, the, the, the UN has been uh, you know, criticized for uh, really not having any power, that, that it's a, a paper tiger. So uh, uh, no, no matter what you guys do in the meetings and the conferences, if the, each government says, uh, no, we don't like that, a, uh, the, the, your proposals are denied. It reminds me of when I was, uh, you know, selling uh, radio time, and I go over to a general manager of, let's say, a car company, and the general manager would love my proposals, you know, for advertising. Then uh, I call him up a, a week later, and he would say, uh, "No, I love the idea, but I went to my owner, and the owner said, no, we don't have the budget, so therefore I can't advertise.'" 
It's like uh, you're coming up with a proposal with all the diplomats and then them going to the head of their countries and the the uh, whoever's ahead says, no, we can't do that. And the, the idea is squashed. Well, I, I, I'll do the opposite. We came up with very challenging proposal. You know, when my first one, which was taking the issue of nuclear weapons to the International Court of Justice, you know, we're challenging the most powerful countries in the United Nations. The P5 and the Security Council, permanent five, China, France, Russia, US and UK were all against us. They were lobbying hard, trying to twist the arms of the other countries. But we we prevailed. Civil society can be very powerful when it comes together on a specific task and rallies you know, the, the, the common good. And we were pushing the common good. Nuclear war is against the common good. So we managed to get the, this into the International Court of Justice. We then had to argue the case. And of course, the nuclear weapon states were arguing their side, but we won. So it's it's wrong to say just because the powerful countries are trying to hold back the UN that civil society can't be successful in getting initiatives through. Uh, this is just one example. The climate change is now is another one. We've now got a case in the International Court of Justice on climate change. It's going to be challenging the vested interests of the fossil fuel companies, you know, and the, and the automotive industry and the, and the military, which is big contributor to climate. It's going yeah. to be challenging them. But we're there. We're in the court. The, the, the opportunities to get things in the United Nations are much more than what people believe. And partly it's because those with power are trying to convince people, oh, the UN's useless. Don't, don't go there because that means that they'll continue. So we, we have to reject their narrative. There are the, I just gave two opportunities. There are a lot more. The reason I got really involved uh, in the UN was because New Zealand took a case against France in the International Court of Justice against nuclear testing in the Pacific. Now, France is a much more powerful country than New Zealand. Um, and France sort of announced, well, we're not going to listen to the court. But in actual fact, as soon as the court had this case, France had announced, well, we'll stop our nuclear testing. Uh, similarly, Nicaragua, a small country, took the United States to the International Court of Justice back in 1982 over the United States supporting the Contras, you know, counter-revolutionaries that were trying to over militarily overthrow the government in Nicaragua. The court um, found against the United States. Um, the United States president said, well, we're not going to listen to it, but actually it led to the Bolin Amendment in Congress, which made the United States administration support for the Contras illegal. And what that case then did was provide the basis for Oscar Arias, president of Costa Rica, again, a very small country, you know, like three million people, to negotiate the Central American peace accords and bring in all the Central American countries. And neither the United States nor the Soviet Union couldn't stop him. These are two big, powerful countries that had vested interest in either side of the civil war. But because of the International Court of Justice, we got a Central American peace process, which which has succeeded and ended the and ended these civil wars and 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 curtailed the influence of both the Soviet Union and the United States. I could go on with story after story after story about this. Most of these stories are not known because the powerful but people with vested interests don't want you to know these stories. Right. They want you to believe that the UN is weak. They want you to like give up on the UN because that then gives them a free hand. We have an incredible tool with the United Nations that we can use and we have to educate people about how to use it because they, they're they not told this. They're not told that they have this powerful tool that's, that, that's there. Well, that, that, that's that, good that, to know. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's why we need people like you who come out exactly. and, uh, and, and tell us about it. As a matter of fact, maybe we can uh, you know, go off the air. I don't know if it'd be possible for you to do like a 10-minute segment each week, mm -hmm. you know, on your own thing, uh, talking about Boy, what, that you're would be great. What, what you're working on. And uh, the good thing about Zoom, yeah, you know, wherever you are in the world, we could do it. Because mm -hmm. we're into podcasting now. We're on Buzzsprout. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, that's... One of our ideas for why we wanted to do this was climate and getting the word out about the environment. But it was also to reach youth. Um, youth taking their information in a lot differently than um, even I or <laughs> people of my ilk, my age group and older and so on and so forth. Um, but 
young people are they're streaming they're listening to podcasts and all that so we're we're trying to break into that medium <laughs> and get the word out if, if, if you're talking to our audience how could they help you where could they send you know where could they find out what's happening with the un or, or environment and uh and, and, and how can they call people or talk to people? Or? Yeah, we have a platform called Unfold Zero. That's UN, which is the UN or United Nations, Fold, F-O-L-D, which is like pulling together, zero, and zero is like zero nuclear weapons. So unfoldzero.org um, is where we have some of this information about the wonderful things and opportunities that are happening and also how civil society can be involved. Um, and one of the key tools we have at the moment uh, is an appeal called Protect People and the Planet. Uh, and it's an appeal which we're taking, bringing into the United Nations. Uh, we've already got you know, some quite high level people as well as ordinary people. It's a mix uh, to um, who, who endorsed. And what that appeal is doing is looking at some key initiatives that we think are achievable in the UN. One of those is, uh, is uh, preventing nuclear war. Uh, and so far, we have prevented nuclear war, even though there have been many threats. Remember, c close. We have to make sure that we don't lose that one because a nuclear war and everything's over. So there's still you know, work we have to do to prevent nuclear war. No first use policies. Another one is to cut the nuclear weapons budgets because there's $100 billion a year being spent on new nuclear weapons. Uh, and there's companies making them, about 27 in the world, so also to ensure that we don't invest in those companies if they're making nuclear weapons. And the third is to shift those budgets that $100 billion a year or the investments in the nuclear weapons companies, shift it into climate protection, into environmental protection, into peace, uh, into sustainable development, uh, into health. You know, these are issues which could be elevated uh, through that. So there's a direct connection between peace you know, and ensuring we have sustainable development and a, and a better planet uh, because of the one, the finance, the money that's going into war. We're picking on the nuclear weapons budget, which is 100 billion. The entire military budget is about 2.3 trillion per year. But the nuclear weapons are ones which, regardless of whether or not you're in a conflict with another country, you don't need nuclear weapons. They are, they are, a zero sum game destroyer of everything and so that's that's the part that's easy to sell or, you know to get, or to get rid of is the nuclear weapons part no when you're talking about yeah. budget you're talking about that the world spends on yeah there are nine nuclear armed states about half of the global nuclear weapons budget is spent by the united states and the other half is the other eight countries combined hmm. Can you imagine what they could do with that money if it was uh, diverted? Yeah, yeah. And in the United States, there are efforts in Congress, like Senator Markey, for example, has the SANE Act, yeah. Smarter Approach to Nuclear Expenditure, uh, which is calling on a huge cuts in nuclear weapons budgets. He also had one called the ICBM Act, Invest in Cures Before Missiles. Um, the ICBM is also Intercontinental Ballistic Missile. Um, but he's coming out next week. Um, with one called HALT, which is not quite as ambitious, but it's like it's a difficult environment with the conflict with Russia at the moment. So the HALT Act will also be uh, cutting a certain amount of the nuclear weapons budget. Basically, don't make any new ones. Um, so that one, as I said, will be coming out next week. But the problem we have in the United States is the nuclear weapons corporations are very powerful. Uh, they make a lot of money. As I said, about half of the nuclear weapons budget, a little bit more than that, actually, is spent in the United States alone. So these corporations do a lot of lobbying. So Senator Markey puts out some very good bills, but he can't he can't get a majority in Congress uh, because even some Democrats are bought off by the weapons corporations. Yeah. So there has to be a bit more of a sort of like shame those who are like spending all the money on these nuclear weapons, which are not helping the security of the United States or the security of the world. Do you now, find now, with all? Now, this must be, we keep on talking to each other now, uh, <laughs> which is often done. If you put uh, there's so many things that could uh, you know end the world, so many pro things that are going on now. If you could put it in a category like uh, five, one through five, what do you think is the worst threat? Is it uh, 
uh, nuclear wars? Is it uh, climate change? Yeah, for me, it's climate change. But to put it like, uh, you know, one through five, what do you think we should focus on the most if we have only a limited amount of energy? Uh, greed. I think Mahatma Gandhi said the world has enough for everyone's needs, but not enough for anyone's greed. Mm. I mean, greed is sort of underlining it. It's like getting as much as I can for myself or my country uh, and not caring about the others, about the other countries. If we can get beyond that to common security is one that's not based on greed, but it's based on need, on what do we need in the world to be you know, safe, be secure, to have a future, to ensure everybody has a future. So I just say, let's get out of the self-interest, out of the, whether it's an individual or nation state, bring common interest, because the common interest in, in the end is actually our self-interest. If we're going to keep focusing just on our individual countries or indiv indiv individuals, then we're going to destroy the, destroy the world. So that, to me, that underlies whether it's climate change or whether it's nuclear weapons or anything else, it's in a sense the same approach, which is hurting and leading us towards destruction. And it's also the same alternative approach, a common security approach, which is going to resolve uh, those issues. Yeah, well, it, 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 uh, you know, when I first heard of we, uh, uh, we the people, what, what, what I... World. Uh, we, the, we world. the world, we the people, we the <laughs> world. Uh, she keeps, that's why I have one of the reasons that she's here all the time, at time because she keeps on correcting me. <laughs> well, well, like Alan Weiss has said that. <laughs> anyway, uh, what, what intrigued me about them is that it's always been my uh, philosophy. It, it's, we're not one country, we're not one person. With what's happening now, we're one world. Because no matter and what, it's we consciousness from right, me, self-interest and greed to we thinking about everybody. Because yeah, no matter what politics. happens in the world, it's not the, uh, you know, it's not look it's strictly there. I mean, a perfect example, and I don't know whether this is good or bad. Is you know uh, the the uh, uh, COVID 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 nineteen. Now we don't know what it was caused by, but let's say it was started in China, but whether accidentally or just by nature, but it affected the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, a, yeah, well, a, a, nucle a nuclear bomb or an explosion, no matter where it happens, is spread all over. I mean, all it takes is wind. Yeah. And one of the problems that we had with that is that there wasn't enough respect for the World Health Organization, which was, you know, basically trying to get the information at the beginning. They got held back a little bit from the Chinese in the beginning. But once, once there were information was, hey, there is this, uh, this virus which has the potential, they were alerting the world to it. So it was the World Health Organization that said, and we have to manage this as a global thing. It's a global health problem. And then what happened in the United States is President Trump withdrew the United States from the World Health Organization. It seems totally the opposite thing of what you should be doing. When you have a global crisis, you need to build global management of that. Um, otherwise, you're going to have huge problems. But the well, the if he thought we could drink government. bleach, and then we would be okay. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, yeah. But the thing is that there's there are a number of these global problems do need global management and global governance. Global governance doesn't take away from individual rights. Exactly. Or does it take away from state rights or federal rights? They are still, all these coexist, but it's like looking at, there are some parts of our um, humanity and our existence and our environment that have to be managed in a global way. Others that have to be managed at the federal level, some at the state level, some at the city level, and some at the individual level. So mm -hmm. understanding that governance happens at all these multiple levels, and it's just what's the appropriate task and, that you're focusing on. And at, the at social the change can change yeah. at every level. And that's, yeah. That was Rick's whole idea is that there are all these silos doing great work, but why not work together? Not so to take away their individual identity, but it was just the idea. Change is going to happen when enough of us are pushing together, especially yeah. on a yeah. global I, level. I, 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 I was just thinking uh, if we could find a way to clone you. Yes. <laughs> you know, there, there, there's not, there's not, that. There's not enough people in the world, uh, you know, uh, th that have your dedication mm -hmm. and knowledge. Yeah, yeah. Well, and the ability to communicate it too, so that it's understandable. You know, yeah. I mean, 
somebody could be brilliant and know all of it, but they can't say it, you know, and, and it, it takes a lot of patience and perseverance and, you know, it, it takes all kinds of people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One of the gaps we have at like the global level is that mm, we don't invest enough yet at that level of management. So mm -hmm. for example, the United Nations, the core budget of the United Nations is just over $6 billion. And that's about the same as the annual budget for the New York police force. Oh. So here you have like a body which is doing global governance on a whole range of issues, you know, health, migration, the airspace, uh, the oceans, you know, like so much. Um, and yet the budget is given to do all this is very minute given the tasks that it's supposed to do. Uh, if you compare that with the, the amount of money it's spent in military, it's minuscule. So one of the things we really need to do is elevate our investment in the global management mechanisms and the United Nations is the most important because that's the one. Yeah, I agree. Alan, I, I hate to cut you off, but our, our half hour is up. Oh, that was quick. <laughs> yeah, right. It's, if, if you have any last words or uh, uh, email that people or websites that, that people can uh, you know, get in contact with you. Yeah. Unfoldzero.org, I think is the best. Um, and I'm Alan, A-L-Y-N, at P-N-N-D dot O-R-G. Okay. Plus, you can reach out to me at Yana Larson at we.net, and our website is we.net, and um, we work together uh, as, you know, we try, wish we could do more, but at least we can do these sorts of things where we I'm on, we are appear on your webinars, you appear on ours, and, and we work together. So right, and, great and, and, and I'm, you know. I'm sure we'll have a lot more business with you. And, <laughs> you I look forward to uh, that. And there'll that, be a quiz. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. And you're thank listening you. to Malcolm and We, heard exclusively on MalcolmPresents.com. All our shows are on demand and archived. And we will see you next week. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. The objective of the organization We the World is to facilitate cooperation on a global scale amongst groups and individuals dedicated to implementing solutions to the many challenges we face on the planet at this time.